All right, on this episode of the LPDS, we provide a little bit of an update, just a little bit of an update to the whole GateGate situation. We talk about some LPDS universe current events and and happenings and what have you. And I share a little story about JPL3, my father, that sort of gives you a little bit more insight into the into the mind of a madman. So all that plus a great cage fact coming up right now. All right, Jabronis, we're back. Welcome back to Libretti Podcast Diary Show. I'm your host, Libretti. Hope everybody had a good week. I certainly did. Kept it busy and eventful as usual. Popping up my sponsor notes here on my phone real quick. Sorry about that, folks. If you're looking here in YouTube land. Um, real quick LPDS caveat before we get into anything. I have really bad allergies this week. For whatever reason, I have been getting worse and worse and worse with the allergy reactions and being able to handle it year after year. I don't know why. I'm trying to figure out how to not get worse at the allergic reactions from seasonal allergies. Now, I'm in Texas, but obviously it's a little warmer down here. The, you know, the seasons start a little differently around these parts. So we're getting you were we're right into our sort of our spring era, rainy season. Flowers are blooming, stuffs budding, and pollens starting to starting to come in droves. And for whatever reason, like I said, um, I can't I can't escape it. So forgive me for the raspy voice if I have one. Forgive me for. The Rudolph alcoholics schnoz I got going on right now from blowing my nose and wiping my nose. My eyes look like Jack Skellington right now, like two black eyes. So it's uh, it's a bit of a circus act over here. So I'm gonna try to keep this uh, brief, but also entertaining and you know educational for you guys because at any moment I can go into another sneezing fit and you know blow the whole house down because of this honker right here. So with that, this is the 200th episode of the Libretti Podcast Diary Show. Now, I debated on if I wanted to do something big and grandiose and crazy, like some man-on-the-street stuff or a clip show of just putting together clips of old episodes or whatever. Um, But... I, I didn't do that. We're gonna we're going with a regular episode, and here is my mindset on that. And this is you can agree or disagree with me, whatever. My mindset on that is I plan to do this show until I can't do this show anymore. So if there's an apocalypse, if the power grids go out forever. If I die, that's that's what's keeping me from doing the LPDS. So why do I want to celebrate this quote-unquote milestone episode if there's going to be a billion of these, folks? A billion episodes. So my mindset is treat this like another episode because we're going to keep, we're going to de- keep doing more and more and more and maybe when we when we reach a serious significant milestone like i don't know 1000 10000 something ridiculous like that then we'll then we'll talk about it. i don't know maybe I'll, I'll i'll probably change my mind 15 times in the next i don't know 3 weeks probably so but my mindset is just to keep everything running like we've have been doing the past almost 4 years now 
And this is a well-oiled machine. You might not think it based on some of the historical issues we've had in the past on the tech side with audio and video and and the fact that, you know, 12 people watch this at any given moment. Uh, this is a well-oiled machine. This is exactly what I'm looking for, what I wanted out of this program, out of this show. I hope it's exactly what you're looking for. And I and I plan to continue doing this for myself and for you guys in perpetuity. So thank you for for being a part of this for this long. 200 episodes, it does sound like a long time. It has been almost four years every Sunday, basically. I think I started doing Sunday schedule with the with the posting of these with these episodes in the first year. I was doing it randomly in the beginning to figure out what, you know, how I wanted it to work and how many episodes a week and all that stuff. But I think it's been the Sunday special, the Sunday sermon for almost the entire time. So I appreciate you guys being with me for this long. It's, uh, it's, it's humbling. And I'm not just saying that it is humbling and it's, it really, it really means something to me that we don't have a big audience, but we have a we have a loyal, really dedicated, tremendous audience, uh, and I'll take that any day of the week. So thanks for thanks for being a part of this. This is one of my favorite things to do in my life right now. Uh, so thank you for for sharing that with me for so long now, uh, and uh, we're just gonna keep doing it. We're going to keep going strong. So stay stay tuned for more. Now, with that, I got a, a very minor update in what I'm now calling GateGate. I got that from my buddy Steve McStiff. And if you're not tracking what I'm talking about, go back to the previous two episodes where I talk about the whole situation going on with my fence and my gate in my backyard and the commercial property owner trying to trying to start a you know start a war here. So um since since we've last spoke, I have put up some no no further boards have been put up on the gate. I'll say that. It has been quiet in that regard. Okay, so there hasn't been any any official declarations of war. Uh, any other aggressive maneuvers just yet, which has been nice, but also, like I said, I, I'm a I'm a war drug addict. I'm a fake war drug addict. I kind of want this lady to make the move and to and to make me have to, you know, take care of business, if you will. So, but it's been quiet. I put up some signs on the gate. One is a beware dog sign because. I got the little rascal Randy over here. By the way, I do have to, another LPDS caveat about Randy. So most of you know, I think I've discussed this on the on the show in the past. He's got a very weird, sensitive stomach situation going on where besides the fact that he has to eat basically human food like ground beef and sweet potatoes and, and real vegetables and stuff like that and not any of the dog food kibble crap, um, if he goes too long without eating, he'll th he'll throw up. He'll dry heave and then he'll throw up like bile. And a couple days ago, I've slept a little too long for his liking, I guess, and his stomach started acting up. This is like the first time in a couple years, actually. It's been he he got sick again, and he threw up here in the office. And I still can't get the smell out of the room. I. Cleaned it up on the floor. It was on the on the the hardwood, not hardwood. It's the fake hardwood, but the hard floor, and it, and it's there was some spillage on the futon cover that I had. So I cleaned it up. I washed the cover. I first I cleaned the cover, then I took it off after and washed it, and cleaned it that way officially that way. I cleaned the pillowcase. I cleaned his bed. None of the, There was no throw up or puke on that, or no bile on that. Cleaned it all up, and for whatever reason, there's still that 
slight stench of doggy puke in here, and it's disgusting. I have a, a Glade plug-in on the wall to start pumping apple cinnamon aromas in the in the room to try to combat it, but now it just smells like apple cinnamon throw up. And I can't figure out where the rest of it is. I looked everywhere. I don't know if I have to burn the futon or what I got to do. I'm looking at it right now. There is no signs of puke anywhere else. I can't figure out why there's still that sort of stale, dead stench in the air, and it's and it's driving me crazy. Absolutely crazy that I had to come in with this schnoz, even th during allergy season, and I can still catch whiffs of it. So anyway, that's Randy. So I got the Beware Dog sign up. I also have a private property, no trespassing sign I put up on the gate. And if I remember, I'll post a picture of it here. Uh, to show you what it looks like. And it's been quiet in that regard. But I also consulted an attorney here in Texas. And not just any attorney. I consulted a very young, aggressive, gunslinging attorney by the name of Mr. Motometti Esquire. I'm not going to give you his first name. None of your business. But this guy is... He is what I would need should this thing go the war route, if you will. Okay? He's, ag he's aggressive. We talked about what my options would be. And every option he mentioned included victory. That's the bottom line. It was There was no option on, on his mind that ended in some sort of compromise or strange armistice where we just let this thing go if if this lady makes another move on the gate every option he had in his arsenal if she made the move and chose war was to win the war and that's exactly what i wanted to hear and what i needed so we are ready okay i i already had the conversation with JPL3 and let them know like, hey, if there's a war declaration, you're in the you're in the back. Okay, you're, you know, loading up the cargo planes to fly out the supplies to me. You're providing your support from the rear, but I I can't have you, you can't be in war. Okay. It would be like in Godfather when in the beginning of Godfather, when Michael Al Pacino's character is is not part of the business yet, and he offers to be part and help out, and they said, "No, we can't get you involved. It's too, it's not your world. Don't you don't be involved in this." This that's kind of what it was like. And my father, it's not like if he started doing this, he would become a madman, uh, you know, and want to go to legal war all the time. He's been he's been dealing with this his entire career as a as an attorney of being put in situations where he had to make decisions of go the ethical moral route or to hold his ground or to even be more aggressive or to or to look for the compromise and the win-win situations and he's always chose the the win-wins and he's always chose the moral ethical uh and i'm never gonna dog on him for that i i mentioned that in the past he's that's who he is and that's who i that's who we want him to be but for this situation, he's on the sidelines. If it gets to that. Right now, we're good. But if it gets to that, we're ready, folks. Okay, so stay tuned for more if there's more. Hopefully not. Hopefully hopefully there is. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. But that's what we got going on in the gate gate update. Um the only other thing I want to mention as far as LPDS updates is I don't know if some of you saw this, if you have social medias or what have you, but I have been, admittedly, I talked about this already. Uh, I got sucked in hard to The Bachelor this season, season 28, 29. I don't know what it is with uh, Philly Trash Joey and all the gals in there. And I've been I've been sucked in to that show and to into that world right now. Uh it's been I liked it. I, I like it. I'm not even gonna I'm not even embarrassed to say it. I'm not ashamed to admit it. It's enjoyable to me. 
the show seems to have veered away from just picking all, mostly like influencer wannabes when it comes to the gals or the fellas that are just on the show to get to get followers and fame that way. It seems like so far, most of the women, there's obviously a couple already that you can tell are not in it to win it, but most of the women are there for love. And The Bachelor, Joey, is absolutely there for love. I think he was on The Bachelor and came close to winning. He's, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Not a heartthrob. He's a good-looking fella, uh, but he's, you know, he's captured the hearts and minds of of the viewers of the of the bachelor community bachelor nation so it's been good but what i started doing and this is sort of on the business end of things for the spearhead leadership stuff i started taking notes on leadership examples within the show and making little you know 5 5 6 minute videos to post on social media on youtube uh, to to discuss the good leadership, the bad leadership, how to kind of handle that, how to incorporate that sort of leadership example into your own lives, uh, things like that. And um, with that, I got a suggestion from my buddy Steve McStiff's wife, Julia. She specifically uh, helped me out here, and and for that, I want to give her a shout out by her real name and not by you know Mrs. McStiff. I don't think that's a uh, she deserves more. She deserves better than that. So uh, Julia turned me on to another show, which is a lot more chaotic, a lot more drama, a lot more craziness called The Challenge on MTV. And I'm, not, I'm sure some of you have heard of that show as well. But that show's crazy. A lot of drama, a lot of gossiping, a lot of cheating, a lot of scandals, a lot of this and that, but also a lot of opportunity to learn and grow and improve on the leadership side. So that is another show I'm going to be doing when the next season starts. This current season, season 175 of it is about to end uh, in a few days here. So when the new season starts in March, I believe, I'm going to start picking apart the leadership examples there and hopefully brings some communities together. It brings the reality TV show community together and the self-improvement leadership community together, and we can all learn and grow and improve together and be entertained together. So if you have a show that you watch, a guilty pleasure, whatever it is, let me know if you think there is opportunity to take away from you know some goodness from those shows besides just the entertainment value of it, send it. Send it my way, and we'll try to, we'll try to have some fun with it because it's been fun. I don't necessarily like reality TV shows per se for the most part, but I'm open to them all. Not not Vanderpump. I don't I don't like that show. I don't like the Real Housewives. I don't like the um basketball wives or whatever it's hoop hoop wives, hoop divas. I don't know what the hell it's called. Rap hip hop nation wives. I don't that stuff where it's just completely scripted nonsense. And fakery, I don't have time for that. But Survivor, Bachelor, Bachelorette, um, this this challenge show potentially things like that. That there are examples to find, you know, good examples to find and and to take out and learn from in the, in there. So if you have them, let me know, and we'll see about making some some content for it. So I've been. I've been focused. I've been really trying harder to get better at focusing my content on on things that are relatable and that people can actually get some some value out of, as opposed to just just sticking with the. Here are three tips to be a better leader in your life. Like those are valuable, but people don't receive that stuff as well. They see that and the, and it's a little too. It it just seems a little too scripted and fake and not genuine. And I'm I'm trying to. I'm trying to actually provide real value on, on the spearhead leadership side. So uh, that's the intent behind that. Anyway, uh, I think that's all I got with the current events. Let me check my notes real quick. Yeah, that's it. So with that, we'll get into the good stuff and we'll step into the cage. Okay, let's run. 
today's Into the Cage segment is proudly sponsored by The Pocket Pal. Have you ever been in a situation where you're chowing down on a top tier sandwich or a taco or even a slice of pizza and want to save some of it for later, but I have nowhere to store it when you're on the go? Then you need a Pocket Pal today. The Pocket Pal is a special liner made of plastics and asbestos that fits perfectly into your pocket so you can slide that meatball sub right in without ruining your pants or compromising the integrity of the sub. So now when you're at some shit holiday barbecue at your buddy Caden's house and there's nothing to eat there but cucumber sandwiches, you don't have to worry because you know you have an entire beef burrito safely tucked away in your cargo pants. So to get a pocket pal today, visit www.safeguardsubs.com. And if you use the promo code Fanny Frankfurter, you'll get a free Fanny Pack pocket pal with your order. I know in the world of skinny jeans and tight pants and all that stuff going on these days, it's it's difficult to, you know, unless you're sliding in a tortilla or or a potato chip it's tough to get you know stuff in your pockets like that these uh, unless you're wearing cargo pants or jenko jeans that have the long three foot pockets in the back but man if if they you know if you have the ability to get a pocket pal and a liner that keeps your sandwich protected and fresh so you can slide it out for later. You don't have to worry about ruining, you know, messing up your pants. Talk about a game changer. I eat slow as hell. Anybody who knows me knows I am a slow eater. I can't help it. I got fast after boot camp when we had it, when we had to shovel food down our throats because we only had 10 minutes to eat or else we starved. But after that, I'm I'm slow. If I'm really hungry, I'll 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 slide it down, so to speak, but most of the time now it's I'm taking my time. I'm stopping for breaks. I'm watching TV. I'm reading. I'm talking, and uh, the food is still there. And then everybody else wants to leave the restaurant when we're out and go do stuff, and um, they have to wait on me or I have to get a to-go bag. And the to-go bag is, yeah, cool. It's great, but you got to carry it. Then, you know, no matter where you go, it's like, oh, I can't go to this bar with this to-go bag. You know, it's you can't do it. Maybe you got to put it in the car. Maybe you're not driving. Maybe you're walking or Ubering. So it becomes inconvenient. Now, if I could just put that stuff in my pocket or my fanny pack, we're in business. I had a friend one time when I was in South Dakota. She would have, she would have her purse with her at, at bars and, and what have you is. And she would have a little bag of snacks in there, like trail mix or chocolates or cotton candy or whatever it was. I don't know why I said cotton candy, but who's who's packing to go cotton candies? But she, it was so clutch. And it was a little bit more, you know, women are mo- more often than not carrying purses or clutches around. So they have the ability to put that stuff in there. Um, Luckily for me, I carry the fanny pack around. Most of my friends don't pack up. So if I had a liner for it, bam, I'm sliding those chicken quesadillas in there. I'm ready to rock and roll. So go get yourself a uh, a pocket pal. Now, the cage fact. This is more like a, a nice little happy update. If you're a Netflix fan or a Netflix subscriber, this this couple couple weeks ago, they just dropped a Nick Cage rom-com classic that I'm sure most of you have not seen or even heard of. It's called It Can Happen to You. It is a it's a it's a movie where he's a cop. He's actually married to Rosie Perez, you know, the 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 chick from uh, White Man Can't Jump. And I'm pretty sure that's literally all she did. Those two movies. I don't remember her from anything else. But he meets this waitress at a diner and basically falls in love with her and they get a lottery ticket together. It's, and he, they make the joke like, well, you know, do whatever we want. If we get this lottery, blah, blah, blah. And they actually win the lottery and they make national news and it's a whole big, how you doing? And then Rosie Perez, his wife is trying to steal the money from them and this and that. And it's, it's a funny love story. 
and he's a New York cop, Yankees fan, lives in Queens or something like that. It's a it's a quality movie that not a lot of people have seen. It's very underrated. Um, but not only is it on Netflix now, it is already a top. It was a top ten movie at the time of this recording. And if that says, you know, if nothing else says the power of Nick Cage, then you put an old Nick Cage movie out there that nobody's ever remembered. Nobody who's who's a big Netflix fan right now, a subscriber. Most of those people, most of us don't know that. They don't know about Nick Cage's 80s classics. And they put that out there and within days, top of the charts, top 10. And you could bust my balls all you want about being biased about Nick Cage and liking him, but he really is not that good. You just like him for some reason, yada, yada, yada. And time and time again, the people speak and the numbers don't lie. And there's a reason why they call him the great one. And it's not just because I coined the phrase for him. It's because he's the best to ever do it. Okay, he made a movie in the 80s where he's a cop with no Nick Cage outbursts in it. And his wife is Rosie Perez, who is known for only one other movie. And it went to the top of the most popular streaming service within days. That's not me. Okay, as much as I like to take credit for that, that's not me who watching that a billion times. That's the people speaking. So that's the cage fact for you today. We'll move on over to the junction. Spin the logo up. Now I want to I want to look behind the curtain a little bit of my, you know, of the story of my father JPL3 and and we'll culminate this in a, a now funny story that was not so funny at the time. For a little bit, it wasn't so funny. Now it is. So my father grew up, he was born in the 50s. So grew up 50s, 60s, you know, in, in New York, in Queens. And my grandparents, his parents, grandfather were World War II vet. They were depression. They grew up in the depression. Okay. So if you hear the term scarcity mindset, scarcity living, things like that, that's basically where it comes from, where specifically the depression era children growing up in that time, like my grandparents were, my mother's parents too, everything that everything that they were able to get, especially food-wise, they were holding on to and hoarding and saving because you didn't know when your next meal was going to happen or if it was going to come at all. For a decent amount of time there, a lot of people were standing in bread lines, okay? Begging and pillaging and doing whatever they can for every scrap of edible things out there, and they were hoarding it and saving it because it was scarce, scarcity mindset. Okay. Now, when you have people who grow up in that in that world where it was literally a scarcity environment, that's all you know. So that's how you're going to raise your kids. And I even know there's a little bit more abundance at that time when my father grew up. It still wasn't completely abundant when it comes to food availability. Certainly not like now with all the fast food joints and giant super size grocery stores and Costco's and what have you. So he was brought up in the same mindset as my grandparents. Whatever you get, you hold on for, for dear life because you never know when it's going to be all gone and you have to go to your stockpile to survive. So now I we have two parents. We have Crazy Carol and JPL3. Both grew up under parents who lived through the depression, who lived the scarcity environment, 
and we're brought up in that scarcity mindset of we got to save all this stuff. And there's a good amount of their parenting that that had us thinking that way too, more so on the money side and less so on the food side, but we had it too a little bit. And it took a little breaking out of that for myself to kind of understand, to be able to pick apart a little bit better what I can and should be saving more of and what I don't necessarily need to worry about. Okay? Now follow me here, fellas, because this is going somewhere. When I go home in the wintertime to my parents, you know, I stay for a few months. This past, this past stint... I go, I go home, and they have two refrigerators and a full freezer. So they essentially have a refrigerator, you know, two refrigerators with freezer drawers, like regular fridges, like everybody else has in their kitchens. And then they also have a stand-up freezer, storage freezer, like hunters have. Okay, they have this not because. They're holding lavish get-togethers and parties for hundreds of people where they need to store all this food to be able to cook it for everybody and have it all there. I would say, and this is not an exaggeration, okay? I wish it was. 75% of the freezer space in my parents' freezers, 75% is bread items, bagels, rolls, Italian loaves of bread, regular loaves of bread, tortillas, flour tortillas, English muffins, some croissants. I think I saw a couple croissants and pizzas. Not frozen pizzas, folks. Pizza they bought at Anthony's Pizzeria down the street that they had leftovers of, and they put them in the freezer. Okay? So, I made it my mission, one of my missions while I was up up there in, in the motherland in Jersey for the winter to do the best I can cleaning out their freezer of all their breads and garbage. Now, again, I grew up under the, a similar mindset of them is we're not wasting food. Okay, so I understand the idea behind it. You don't want to waste food. They're starving people in Africa and China and what have you. So I, instead of throwing most of it away, I would go through and eat it. Okay, I would have a roll with my with my eggs. I would have some bread with my dinners. Um, I would turn anything I could into a sandwich of some sort, whether it was on a bagel, in a tortilla, or whatever just to start cleaning out this bread. It was like that episode of Seinfeld where Elaine and her old boss are running the uh, the top of the muffin to you store where it's just muffin tops and they have all these muffin bottoms, these stumps that they had to get rid of and nobody's taking them. So they hire Newman to come in as a cleaner and he just comes in with a bunch of bottles of milk and he just starts chowing down on these muffin stumps to clean them out. That's what I was doing. I was muffin stumping. I was Newman cleaning them out uh, and without them knowing. Like, I didn't tell them I was going to do this. I just had to clean this crap out. And they were just happily surprised that when they opened the freezer to put actual food in, like pork chops or, or beef or whatever, or chicken, you know, chicken cutlets that they wanted to put in the freezer, they were happy to see, oh, we got some room in here. And they didn't ask questions why. At least my, at least my mother didn't. Um, so all was well. Okay. And that's why I had to join a gym. Usually when I'm home in the winter time, I'll just go running in the cold or I'll do push ups and pull ups and stuff in the basement to maintain. Um, but I had to burn a couple, a couple more calories to stay fit or I was going to get fat. Um, so I was hitting the gym harder and I'm happy to say I maintained my weight. Usually I gain weight when I go home there. And I'm happy to say I maintain my weight because I was vigorous with the working out because of all the bread intake. So that's why you see this body is still 
pretty svelte, all things considered. Now that you know that I was basically on a loaf of bread diet a day for two and a half months, I'm not bragging, but objectively speaking, that's decently impressive, folks. Okay, that's decently impressive. I don't know what the long term effects are going to be. I could have, I could be setting myself up for diabetes here very soon. I don't know, but weight wise. And aesthetically, I think I did an okay job. And I still and I feel good. I don't feel too lethargic or like my blood is made of sludge or anything like that. So not too bad. Now, I had a I had a little bit of like a Schindler's list moment when I left to drive back down to Texas. And and let's not get too dramatic with it. It was one of those things where I didn't get all the bread items out of there. Okay. I, I can only do so much. I'm just one tiny, stumpy little Italian human being, and I can, only, I can only take down so much stuff, so much bread. Okay, so there was, there's still a decent amount of, of archived and stockpiled bread from months, years ago, whatever, and I couldn't take care of it all. So I felt like, oh, I, if, I, if only I had one more loaf, one, one more slice of pizza, I could help them more. But I had to leave. I had to come down here. Fast forward to the, earlier this week, okay? Now, not without getting into any details because it's none of our business, but my father, he's going in. He's supposed to be going in for a scheduled procedure here in a few weeks or whatever. So they have him on his preparatory supplements and medication to get ready for this stuff. Um, and part of that is like dealing with some of the reactions and side effects of these of these suppies and medications and some of them are not great and some of them are fine. So he's they're him and the doctors and, and everybody's going through all that. Well, he was on these new suppies, these new vitamins. And a couple days ago, he started getting real sick and we're talking like vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration. I think he got so dehydrated and dizzy to the point where he, almost passed out trying to walk to the, to his recliner or whatever. And he was having a bad day. Crazy Carol was saying how they were thinking about it. They might have to take him to urgent care. They don't know what the deal is. They don't know which medication is doing this to him, blah, blah, blah. And then they, then she inadvertently drops the bomb on us. Cause we start asking questions. Well, at least, uh, you know, we're investigators here after all our family. We ask, well, could it be the medications? Could it be something else? We all know that JPL3 does like to sneak a couple of snackies every once in a while if they're around. And I assure you, when I was home, they were not around because I was eating sleeves of Fig Newtons and sugar cookies and Oreos like a madman trying to prevent him from, you know, eating too many too many treats and 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 making it you know becoming a problem for him for his for his procedures and stuff because look he's an adult he's allowed to have all this stuff but he's also not a terribly healthy individual right now and we're trying to get him back on the path of health and wellness so one of those things is to is to get him off the sweets and the sugars and the crap and unfortunately that meant yours truly had to take all that stuff down well I'm not there right now. So we know he likes to sneak some stuff. And sh and my mother assured us, no, no, we don't have any more cookies or desserts in here. You ate all those. Um, all he's had in the past day or two has been, uh, has been pizza for dinner. I was like, well, where'd you get the pizza? And she's like, oh, you know, you can go to Anthony's or wherever, Anthony Franco's, whatever the place is called. I was like, okay, um, did you, did you try it? She's like, She's like, no, it was, you know, it's in the freezer. We got it months ago. There's the red flag, folks. Okay, there's the red flag. Because now I start doing a little bit more digging. Okay, all right. Months old pizza in the freezer. Protected by only tin foil. Because my father only uses aluminum foil for everything, as you know. Okay, what kind of pizza was this? Oh, just the regular stuff that he likes. Pizza with anchovies on it. 
Now I'm pausing here because I want you guys and the LPDS community to do the critical analysis that we did. Okay. I want you to take all the pieces of evidence. I want you to take the historical points of interest. I want you to take the, the, the situation at hand and put it all together to come up with, with the conclusion of this. Okay. Now, here's what I'll tell you. Basically, what my old man did in the midst of preparing for a medical procedure to continue his health and wellness journey, where he's on specific medications and vitamins and, uh, you know, exercise routines and, you know, get, keeping out of stressful environments and all this stuff. He decides it's a good idea to go through his freezer. And I don't know where this is. This must have been like he had this hidden in a secret compartment in one of the freezers because he knew that I was coming for his food or something. And he finds, he finds this months old, months old tinfoil package of pizza slices. Not only that, it's not just months old bread and and cheese and regular pizza. It's months old fish pizza, anchovy pizza. Now, I'm not saying I don't like anchovies. That's an acquired taste for sure. I know most people don't like them, but I love them. Okay. At Christmas time for a part of the seven fishes, as my father makes this, it's called Alige. It's it's a it's a it's an angel hair pasta with uh with a oil and anchovy sauce that's made. I love it. Okay. And I've also eaten anchovy pizza before. And I also like that when it's fresh. Okay. When they take the anchovies right out of the jar, right out of the sea, practically, and put it on the pizza and you eat it right then and there. Okay. Even at my age and physical health and well-being that I am compared to my old man, I would not eat anchovy pizza that's more than two days old. I don't care if it's been in the freezer, if it's been recooked, nothing. And this and this depression mindset guy, for some reason, thought, this is okay. We're pushing a year old on this pizza, and it's fish. I'm just gonna nuke it in the microwave for three minutes because he likes to he likes to over nuke everything just to play it safe after all. And that's gonna that was gonna be the thing that's gonna make this to turn this rotten fish pizza into a healthy thing to eat. And then the next morning, he has no idea why he's absolutely destroying the bathroom with with doo doo and 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 throw up all over the place. I don't say all it wasn't all over the place. He kept it clean in the in the tur to turl it as my grandmother called it. But no idea why he thought it was the meds, he thought he was dying this and that. And it was really just the fact that he ate 6 month old anchovy pizza and and he'll fight you to the death on it. He'll argue that it wasn't months old. We just got it last week, you stupid bastards. Don't you know anything? He's like, yeah, I do know something. I know that if I have pizza with anchovies on it that's more than two days old, I am throwing it in the garbage. Okay? I don't care that it's tough seeing food go to waste at that moment. Okay? I know that A... Good luck finding other people in the area that will take that food off your hands. Most bums want to do it these days. I know there's a lot of spoiled bums out there, but most bums would not take anchovy pizza no matter how free and fresh it is. Okay? And if you're not going to eat it within two days, which I know you're not, which you shouldn't be anyway, you shouldn't be making two, three days of meals only bread and pizza. That's not healthy. Then you should throw it away. Or next time, get a half a pizza, half an anchovy pizza instead of a whole pie. 
And then you don't have to fight with yourself internally on, a, on whether you should save it or not. The answer is always throw out the anchovy pizza when you're not going to eat any more of it that day. That's the answer. Okay, so I don't care if it was only a week old or whatever, or that it was in the freezer, blah, blah, blah. You don't, you don't understand. You don't get it. I don't understand how you thought you'd be able to eat this pizza and be okay after. I also don't understand how you started uncontrollably vomiting and diarrheaing and didn't immediately realize it was the months old anchovy pizza. Now, the LPDS caveat all this for you. I haven't talked to my old man about this yet. Okay. Now, I know there's going to be haters out there that say, go easier on your old man. He's earned it. Leave him alone, this and that. I haven't even talked to him about it. So we haven't had this back and forth argument. I'm just making all this speculation up. And I'm, I don't plan on giving him crap for it. I'm going to give my mom crap for it because she knows better. She's also worked in the medical community for her entire career. So she also has a decent wherewithal of the fact that old anchovy pizza, regardless of frozen or not, is not a good idea to eat after a couple months regardless. So I'll give her a little crap for it, but I'm not saying I'm not doing anything to my old man. I'm going to be nice and respectful, make sure he's doing okay. He is okay. Bottom line is he okay. He's okay. It was a little nerve wracking there um, when, you know, he was getting dizzy and dehydrated and we didn't know why. But now that we know why and now that we know that he's okay, we can make fun of him a little bit. And that's what our family does, by the way. Okay, we roast each other. We bust each other's balls. We laugh. We move on. We love each other. That's it. It's not, we're not taking shots. It's not personal jabs to, to really hurt somebody's feelings. It's none of that crap. We're, we're going to have a good laugh about it because everything is hunky-dory again. Okay? And, and if you're worried about him, there's no need to email him. Or reach out and be like, I hope you're okay. I heard about this. Don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. Don't. He's not going to know what you're talking about. He doesn't listen to this show. Okay. He's not going to know. He's not going to have any idea. He probably doesn't even remember having to deal with the ordeal to begin with. So um, thank you for the kind words. If you're thinking about him, he's fine. Everything is great. And it makes for a great story. But the lesson here is uh, don't do that shit, okay? There is no need in the 21st century to hoard bread like that. And I'm sorry to everybody in YouTube land watching me deal with my allergy stuff. I apologize. I hate it right now. It's killing me. But there's no need to fill up essentially two full freezers worth of bread items. Okay. There's, it's not necessary. We don't need to do that. Okay. Buy enough bread for what you need in the moment or for the week or whatever. And that's it. My parents don't even eat that much bread. They bought bagels last year. I remember because I was there, me and Nikki Sticks got the bagels. But a whole bag of bagels. And they didn't eat all of them. And they put them in the freezer. I ate them this past year. They were still in the freezer. And I took them out to eat them. They don't eat the bread. There is no reason to have all that stuff in there. And the more you do that, and the longer it sits in there, the more you're going to accidentally pull out the anchovy pizza and have a full day of diarrheas and, sh and, and vomits and shits all day long. So don't do that. But if your parents do that, or your grandparents, or, or whatever, if they have that mindset in them and they're doing that sort of stuff, I, I beg of you to empathize and understand why they do that before you start making comments or remarks or starting fights over it. Put yourself in their shoes for a little bit. Empathize with why they're like this. And then you can you can move forward a little bit more effectively and have better conversations about it. And you could find ways of compromise of like, hey, 
You don't necessarily need four packs of flour tortillas. We can get this here. And if you don't use it for tortilla stuff, you can fry it up and make chips out of it. And now we can eat it all. We don't have to store it. Like you can find the compromises and find the ways forward and lead through those without it becoming an argument or without calling them out and be like, why the hell do you have nothing but bread in your freezer? This is stupid. Because in, in, in their mind, it's not stupid. They're saving food. Okay, they lived through times where they didn't know if they were going to have food long enough to sustain life, that they had to save all that stuff. Their parents were working their asses off to, to pay the bills and to have enough to put food on the table. So any extras they had, they had a stockpile in. I get it. And it was the same growing up for us in the, in, in the early days until we were able to fend for ourselves a little bit more and sustain our own you know, lives a little bit and help our parents out. So in their mind, it's not a stupid thing. It's not childish. It's not ridiculous to be saving food and not wasting good food. Just like some of the things that I do, or, we, or I'm sure you guys do, that other people think is stupid. And they don't see the reason why. And sometimes there's not a logical reason behind it. Why do I listen to the same song thousands of times in a row? I'm still listening to Sound of Silence, by the way. If you listen to a previous episode, you know what I'm talking about. In fact, I listen to it so much, and I think the creature has listened to it so much that I just saw on social media, the band Disturbed posted that the song Sound of Silence has miraculously and, and and mysteriously shown back up on the top 10 charts as most popular songs this month out of nowhere. It's been out for almost a decade now, this cover. And it recently popped back up. That's how good that song is to me. And there's no logical reason why I just love this song. There's so much inside the song that, that, that hits different parts of my body and mind and soul. I don't have a reason. I can't give you a good, valid reason why it's the only song I've listened to for the past several weeks. I can't. And you might think that's stupid and ridiculous, and that's fine. It probably is stupid and ridiculous. But I don't think it is. Just like my father and my parents don't think saving good food and not wasting it is not stupid and ridiculous. Okay? So all I'm asking is it's funny. It is all funny right now. At the end of the day, it's, it's been funny, entertaining journey that we've had with my parents and their bread hoarding. But it is not something worth arguing about and fighting with your close, close, you know, friends and family and loved ones over. We have to. I'm asking you to empathize and and realize that there is a reason why the, these people do seemingly ridiculous, stupid things. And it's because that reason is is not stupid and ridiculous to them. Okay? So understand that. And then you'll be able to move forward a little bit more effectively in figuring out a solution where everybody wins. Okay? So that's all I got today, folks. Before we go, very quickly, the big three. It's the three pillars to staying strong and being a better, happier, kinder, healthier, more genuine human being and be able to spread that positivity and productivity and goodness on throughout the land. Number one, exercise every day. Whether it's a physical, mental, or emotional exercise, do one thing every day to improve your health and wellness physically, mentally, emotionally. Number two, don't be a shitty person. Be a kind person, okay? When the opportunity arises to be shitty and be negative to somebody, even if they you think they deserve it, Recognize the emotional state you're in in that moment. Detach from those negative emotions and just omit yourself from the situation and don't respond with a negative jab or whatever. Even if that person's really being an asshole, all you're doing is adding to the shit and negativity there. And then when you get wrapped up on it, you become engulfed by negativity, okay? And that spirals you downward. So by just omitting yourself from the situation altogether... You're minimizing the shit and negativity going on in the world, 
and you're allowing yourself the capacity to go focus on more positive, productive things with your lives. Okay, number three, the most important one, be genuinely thankful and grateful for all the good you have in your lives. Because you never know when it's going to be gone. Okay? It's not worth having an argument with my parents about frozen bread and pizza because the day that they're no longer around... I'm not going to be sitting there and, and, and thinking, man, I, I'm glad I spent that time with them arguing about frozen bread and pizza. Okay? So just start by thinking about at least one good thing in your life. Each day do this. Think about at least one good thing and what your life would be like without that thing. And how that makes you feel in that moment. How shitty your life would be. And that'll give you immediate gratitude. And then the more you do that exercise every day, the more and more you're going to be in a state of gratitude as opposed to that state of taking things for granted. And you couple that with not being a shitty person and you couple that with exercising every day. And I promise you, you're going to be a better, happier, kinder, healthier, more genuine human being and you'll be able to spread that positivity and goodness to everybody throughout the land. Thank you guys again for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow and share the, the good word of the LPDS to your friends and enemies. And hit that hotline, 202-670-1114. I forgot to say it in the beginning. That's all right. I'll do it next time. Hotline is 202-670-1114. Call it up. We'll have a good time on it. Thank you guys again. I love you all. Stay strong.